Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, President of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Well, tonight's topic is Charter Checkup. And hello everyone, I'm Shauna Sanford. Well, when the new school year began last month, nearly 10% of Louisiana's 600,000 public school students boarded buses bound to charter schools. Now, prior to Hurricane Katrina, which happened in 2005, charter schools were something of a rarity, but their numbers have increased 170% since the storm. While the majority are in Orleans Parish, charter schools also operate in 19 other parishes, including Caddo, Morehouse, Aboyles, Calcasieu, St. Mary, and East Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. Well, so what is driving the growth of public charter schools in the state? Are they delivering promised educational dividends or putting taxpayers' dollars at risk? And when measuring success, do charter schools compete with traditional public schools on a level playing field? Tonight, Public Square looks for answers. By all accounts, Alexiana was receiving a good education at her former school, all A's and one B on her report card. But her aunt received a reality check after becoming her legal guardian and transferring her to the J.K. Haynes Charter School in Baton Rouge. When school started, I get a letter sent home saying that she didn't know how to read or add. And I'm like, no, that's not so. I said, she could read and add. I said, I know she could do all this right here. After sitting down with Alexiana, her aunt, Dale Moore, realized that this child wasn't able to read a simple sentence or do a basic math problem. I want to shame for her. I was ashamed because the school let her down. Through classroom instruction and free after-school tutoring, Alexiana is now in the fourth grade and performing at grade level. Alexiana is one of the over 58,000 students in Louisiana attending a charter school. Of the state's 1,303 public schools, 110 are charters. And part of what it means to be a charter school, that autonomy, you hear that word a lot. Autonomy means around things like your budgeting, your hiring, your firing, setting your curriculum. Again, it is about putting empowering school leaders, principals, teachers, and parents to make decisions as close to the student as possible. Caroline Romer Shirley is the executive director of the Louisiana Association of Public Charter Schools. Romer notes that while charter schools are not subject to some of the rules and regulations that apply to their traditional public school counterparts, they are held to more rigorous accountability standards. And charters are held accountable in three areas, academics, finance, and governance. Those accountability measures are put in place to ensure that waste, theft, that we are being good stewards of taxpayer dollars, and when we're not. And there will be cases where there are charter schools, just like there have been school districts that are not good at that part of it, we will not allow them to continue to operate. Since 2000, 21 charter schools have closed in the state. We are too quick uh, to say that public schools are failing and then try these experiments on our children. Debbie Moe is the president of the Louisiana Association of Educators. She says that the LAE has many concerns with charter schools, from inexperienced Teach for America instructors in the classroom to selective student enrollment. Charter schools tend to advertise themselves as uh, public schools and therefore they take all children. But there are some uh, charter schools that are selective. Some schools have criteria on the front end in order to get into them. Uh, they front load their criteria and if you don't fit the criteria then you cannot be a part of the school. Other charter schools will do a more open process but sometimes these same charter schools will backload their uh, criteria. So a child that is taken into the charter school system uh, may have to have certain criteria met by the parents. 
uh, the kids themselves may have to maintain certain grade point averages. Mo and other critics say this selective admissions process tends to skew performance data, like those released by Stanford University's Center for Education Outcomes, or CREDO. Its August report, which tracked Louisiana's charters from 2005 to 2011, found that 41 percent of charter students showed larger gains in reading and 42 percent showed larger gains in math compared to their traditional public school peers. The Recovery School District direct run schools have become a dumping ground. Those are the schools kids go to if they can't get into a charter school. So if you're really taking the, the, the lower performing kids who can't get into other schools, it only stands to reason that the charter schools are going to outperform the traditional schools. Karen Royal is a community activist and the parent of a student in the New Orleans public school system. She is critical of charter performance and cites a 2012 report by Research on Reforms that indicates that 79 percent of the charter schools that fall under the Recovery School District in New Orleans are rated D or F. Charter schools in and of themselves are not the answer to why some urban school districts are not serving some children well. We really need to continue to search for the real reform. Uh, if charter schools were the answer, I think seven years in New Orleans should show you some better results than what we're seeing. After Katrina, the recovery school district started taking on large number of F-rated schools. Well, originally three quarters of those schools were Fs and now a tiny number of those schools are Fs. That's great progress. State Education Superintendent John White says the New Orleans schools were at a low level when the state took them over. He expects even more progress this school year. Well, I don't think that uh, this year in the recovery school district, the schools will have DNF grades. I think some of them will, as in many districts, but a lot of them are going to be Bs and Cs. Romer says that while the Stanford study indicates that charter schools enrolled 2 percent fewer special ed students than traditional public schools. The Credo report actually really highlights the fact that Louisiana charter schools are doing an especially incredible job around serving students with special needs. And while Romer admits that having local money follow a student to a charter school may create a financial burden for some school districts. Charter schools are public schools, and when a family chooses a charter school, and again remember, these are schools of choice, it only makes sense for those dollars to follow those families. Whether you're a charter school or a traditional public school advocate, Romer says the discussion about education solutions should focus on outcomes. We're constantly, you know, battling each other. And I think it's time to quit being so contentious and for instead for us to try and be more collaborative as teachers, as educators, as administrators, as parents and students, to look at schools that are getting it done, whatever kind of school that is, and be able to share those innovations. Well, joining us in our studio for what we hope will be a collaborative discussion tonight about charter schools are residents from the greater Baton Rouge area. We're also joined by representatives of both the traditional public and charter schools, as well as two students from the Legislative Youth Advisory Council. Welcome all of you to the program. It is so great to have you here. And I know we're really anxious to get to your thoughts about charter schools, and we're going to do that in just a moment. But first, LSU's Public Policy Research Lab surveyed over 100 citizens around the state state on tonight's topic. Among the survey responses, when asked their opinion about allowing public charter schools to operate independently and free of many of the regulations imposed on traditional public schools, 56% of the respondents favored the idea, 24% opposed the idea of charter schools, and 22% were unsure. When informed that most charters in the state are under the jurisdiction of the Department of Education versus a local school district like the their traditional public school counterparts, 60% of those surveyed favored having local control of charter schools. 33% actually supported the idea of having the state control charter schools. 7% were unsure. If a consistently poor performing school was in their community, 46% of the respondents would recommend keeping the school open and providing outside support. An equal percentage of those surveyed, 16%, would reopen the school as a charter school or reopen the school with a new principal. 
88% of the respondents would close the school and send the students to better nearby schools. 14% were either unsure or refused to answer. And lastly, when asked about the quality of education that students receive at a public charter school compared to a traditional public school, the majority of those who responded, 45%, said they believe that it doesn't make a difference. 34% believe charter students would receive a better education, while 5% believe students would receive a worse education at a charter school. So we are going to start there with our studio audience based on your opinion, your personal experiences. Do you think that... Um, public schools or, or that charter schools offer a better educational opportunity than the traditional public schools. Let's start with you, Diana. You operate a charter school, J.K. Haynes Charter School in East yes. Baton Rouge. In fact, the student who we saw in our piece attends your school. And her mother made some very, very interesting comments uh, I'm sure that you've heard many times before from other parents. But help us to understand where you are in this issue. All right, J.K. Haynes has been a charter school since 1997. As a matter of fact, we piloted the charter school movement here in Louisiana. Um, when we started our charter school, it was we are type one, so our local organizer is the EBR school system. And what we do, we work in conjunction with the school system. We are a school of choice. We are not trying to compete with the regular public school. We work together. And we have done this for the past 15 to 16 years. Uh, we do a lot of nurturing at J.K. Haynes Charter. Our students are just wonderful. We have wonderful parental support. So we have done a lot with our students uh, at J.K. Haynes Charter. Scott, I'd like to get your opinion on this. What, what are your thoughts about charter schools and what role they should play? Well, if Shauna, any. Shauna, I think the only objective way to answer that type question is to look at the data that exists and whether we agree with the accountability system the state has in place or disagree with it, it is what judges charter schools and public schools and student achievement in Louisiana and uh, the vast majority of students in Louisiana attend schools and traditional public schools run by local school boards and the vast majority of our schools in Louisiana are A, B, or C school districts. When you look at the Recovery School District, uh, New Orleans and Recovery School District, Louisiana, and you look at their letter grades, where the vast majority of charter schools exist, the Recovery School District, Louisiana, has a current letter grade of F. The Recovery School District of New Orleans has a letter grade of D. And, and whether we agree or disagree on the issues, that is the way we're judged as school systems by our current state accountability system. Let's get some more thoughts. Uh, is it Belinda? Yes. Yes. Your, your 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 feelings. My thoughts is when you um, are when you think about charter schools, it's important to think about the type of charter school that you are talking about. So, <clears throat> for me, when I examine the Baton Rouge Area Achievement Zone and look at its charter schools, so I think there are seven schools in the Baton Rouge Achievement Zone. I think that they are struggling. What we've seen um, are that their test scores slide after they're taken over by the recovery school district and most of those schools have not recovered yet. So we've had schools that are languishing in the recovery school district while um, charters fail while they try to identify quality charters. Um, I've experienced a lot of conversations with parents in the charter schools where they're frustrated about how long it's taking for charters to be replaced. They hear over and over again, what is a quality charter? Um, and in some cases, there have been schools that have been run by the Recovery School District, direct run without a charter for three years now. And those parents are frustrated by the turnover among their administration and not knowing exactly what's happening with their children. Winston, I want to go to you because you've had some experience in dealing with the charters and uh, you're with 100 Black Men. Yes. Talk a little bit about your experience. We, we operated Capitol High School for three years and one of the things we, we learned is the concept of school performance score is the problem. Um, it, you have to measure students. When capital was put in the recovery school district and then most of the students fled to the EBR system, we were left with a very different student body than what originally existed at capital. And we had to come up with a, a way to educate which was what was mostly an at-risk student body. And we had a pretty good charter operator, but we were disappointed in their ultimate outcome. And so we, we thought it was a failed model. Mm -hmm. And we returned capital to the Bessie board. We, after the third year, we were doing acceptable to Bessie, but we weren't doing acceptable to us. We thought the model 
for an isolated charter school in the recovery school district was just a failed model. Well, doesn't that sort of speak to what Belinda was talking about, the frustration that parents have? I mean, you understand where yes. parents are coming from? Yes, you, you, there's no, the, the question with charter schools for us was not can a new charter school open free of certain restrictions and succeed, it's can a charter operator take over a recovery school district school, a failing school, and then take that student body and turn that student body around. That's what I think we have to measure. And you can't measure the school. You have to measure their improvement with individual students. Yeah. And, and I think that would make the playing field equal. Well, and, and then isn't this a criticism that charter schools, and we heard it in the package, uh, the package there, that charter schools can be selective. I mean, we're, when you talk about educating kids, we're talking about educating all kids. And public schools don't have uh, the ability to turn away kids. They have to educate the kids who actually come to them. Your thoughts about that? I think it's an untrue concept that saying that charter schools are selective. I'm actually a head of school of an open enrolled charter school in New Orleans, and we are okay. performing. Uh, in Orleans Parish school system, we actually have performing charter schools that are setting the bar and outpacing not only the RSD, but the public school system in New Orleans. So I think that we have to look at the charter schools from the concept that we are making gains. We are having successful uh, charter schools that are impacting our youth in New Orleans and making a difference. Once again, Orleans Parish, if you look at it across the board, our charter school system is actually outpacing the public school system mm -hmm. and the RSD system and setting the bar with the concept with all students, not selective students, but all students. So you're saying they're not selective? We're not selective. You're not selective, but you We're, can't speak for, or are you saying all charter schools? All of us have a policy when it comes to the enrollment. Every child in New Orleans has the opportunity to come to the charter schools across the board, citywide. Okay. All right. Let's get your comment. I can tell you're chomping oh. at the bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I personally go to a charter school. Great. Um, I go to Avoyles Public Charter School, and uh, I mean, we're succeeding. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I know that from personal experience. I've gone there since kindergarten. But um, like with the whole, um, we we operate under a lottery system. So I mean, everybody is welcome to apply for our lottery system, but certain are chosen. But I mean, there's no uh, requirements for it. Mm -hmm. But I think what what the common misconception is is that we get students that are already have been molded mm -hmm. but what we actually do is we take in students and mold them into the students that they need to be mm -hmm. and I mean it's it works better just because we have one director one school board looking after one school and that one school focuses on the one student and it just creates a better environment for everybody. Joshua, what grade are you in? Uh, I'm a senior this year. You're a senior. It, it's so great to hear from you. We really appreciate your comments. Trey, I'd like to get you in on this as well. Your thoughts about charter versus traditional. Well, <clears throat> um, the quality of education in Louisiana has been one of those rankings that typically you see 48, 49, 50. It's not one of our, our um, strong points. And so I am in favor of anything that gives the students in Louisiana a better chance at succeeding not only academically but beyond school in life and um, you know uh, finding a good job and providing a life for the the family that they hope to have one day so um, you know I think the best point that I heard in the the, the video that uh, started the show was you know we really need to work together and find the things that are working well with the charter schools and figure out how we can incorporate that into public schools and private schools and be collaborative. Yeah, I, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I really wanted to get your thoughts on that. I thought it was a really great point that she made at the end that it seems like everybody's always fighting each other and that there's never, you know, a, you know, coming together and trying to find some sort of common ground. Is that really what you all would like to see more of, sort of a collaborative discussion, much like what we're having here tonight? Does it seem like there's constant uh, battling going on back and forth, Colston? Yeah, absolutely. I, I I work with the Orleans Parish School Board and we certainly have partnered with our charters to help access funds that maybe we had access to that they weren't able to apply for. We work with them, try to build collaborations around professional development, around providing opportunities to them where there are chances for us to work together. We're all seeking to serve the same students and rather than having sort of these divisive conversations that never seem to end about mm -hmm. what the structure of the school is, parents don't necessarily feel that structure. They see a school and they want to make sure that that school is serving their kids. Whatever the governance structure looks like, whomever may be in charge of it. And I think it's really important that we not lose sight of that as we discuss the rest of the issues. Okay, well our conversation is going to continue. That's it for this portion of the show, but when we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further explore charter schools in Louisiana. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Hello everyone and welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight we're discussing public charter schools in Louisiana and joining us now is our panel of experts. We have Veronica Brooks with us tonight. She is the policy director at the Louisiana Association of Public Charter Schools. Michael Desitel is a retired educator who has served as head of the Louisiana Association of Educators and writes a weekly education blog. Chris Meyer is founder of New Schools for Baton Rouge, a nonprofit dedicated to creating new schools for the 1,200 students in North Baton Rouge who currently attend a failing school. And Dr. Lottie Beebe, a veteran educator, is also a member of the Louisiana Board of Elementary and Secondary Education and superintendent of the St. Martin Parish school system. It is so wonderful to have you all here. Before we get to our audience, and I know that you've been listening in on uh, the conversation, please share with us where you are on charters versus traditional schools. And we'll start with you, Veronica. Sure. Um, so, you know, I think that saying charters versus traditional schools sets up a false dichotomy, actually. I think that uh, really what we should be talking about is what's good for kids and how we're going to make sure that all of our kids are prepared for a competitive economy, uh, you know, not just Louisiana, not just nationally, but on a global scale. And whether that's a charter school or a traditional public school, you know, I personally don't really care <laughs> as long as the work is getting done. And I think that we can really use uh, charter schools as a, as a vehicle to do that, but as it relates to one versus the other, I just I think that's just a false dichotomy that we don't need to make a decision. Okay, all right, Mike, what about you, your thoughts? Well, I agree that, that you can't classify one type of schools as good or bad just b because of its name, uh, but I do have some big concerns about certain types of charter schools, particularly the schools that have been uh, takeover schools where the State Department of Education has taken over certain uh, schools from local school systems and handed them over to charter operations. Uh, I think there is a lot of a, a potential for abuse and uh, I think that really schools work better when they're run by the local school systems, by the local school boards. And I think so, some of those local school boards have set up some excellent charter schools and there's no problem. But I think when you take away a school and give it to the state uh, and you take it away from the people who voted for the taxes for those schools, that's a big mistake and uh, it takes away the public input into those schools. Chris? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think like Veronica was saying, it's more a question about quality and I think excellence, mm -hmm. regardless of whether it's a private school, which has uh, a long tradition here and it's particularly in South Louisiana, a public school or a public charter school. I think the questions we ought to be asking is, uh, one, you know, what are, what are the outcomes and the results that those schools are getting? Because we see examples all across our state and all across the country uh, where schools, regardless of kids' backgrounds, deliver excellent uh, academic outcomes for those kids. Two, I think we should be asking the question of what power are we returning to educators and to parents in whatever that system is? Can the leader of those schools, for example, uh, control all the decisions about what happens in that school to best make decisions for the kids? And do parents have access uh, to, to choose a school that best fits the needs of their kids? And then finally, this question of accountability, that mm -hmm. for schools that aren't performing well, what is our answer, regardless if it's private, public, or charter school public, well, what is our answer when a school is not performing well versus one that is doing well? Why aren't we creating more of those? Yeah, Dr. Beebe. Well, I'm a strong proponent of traditional public schools. In fact, I am a, a graduate of a traditional public school, mm -hmm. and I'm a superintendent of a traditional public school system, and I personally believe that we have a responsibility to educate all children, and with the money that is siphoned away from traditional public systems, in fact, I, I do believe that we have a responsibility responsibility as l educational leaders to provide quality educational experiences for children. You know, uh, we advocate choice for parents, but oftentimes the choice is from uh, transfer from a failing school to another failing school to another failing school. And then we, when we look at the ch charter performance thus far at the, in the RSD, it leaves uh, certainly uh, a question in my mind, uh, why don't we uh, put the resources, allocate the resources to traditional systems, work with traditional systems. I, and I know those critics will say that, uh, you know, we have failed within the public system, traditional system, 
uh, but at the same time, uh, for the past five years, we have had money taken away. In fact, the 2.75 percent increase, we have not received it as school traditional school systems, so it makes it quite challenging to meet the needs of all of our students, but I think we have a responsibility as educational leaders within traditional systems to make that happen. And you mentioned students, and we are fortunate to have some students here with us tonight, and so we're going to begin with them, and we're going to start with you, Haley. I hope I got your name right. <laughs> Tell us where you attend school and what grade you're in. Um, I am a senior at Episcopal School of Acadiana out in Cade, mm -hmm. Louisiana. And what's your question? Um, my question us? is, if charter schools are expected to perform higher score-wise, why aren't teachers required to hold a teaching certificate or accreditation? Very good question. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> I, I think that's a big mistake. The legislature just recently passed a new law that exempted charter schools from having certified teachers. Uh, I think that's a terrible mistake and it, it diminishes the education profession. Uh, there's no reason we shouldn't require certified teachers of all schools. Veronica? Sure. So um, the overwhelming majority of teachers in charter schools are certified. That law was passed um, for the occasional exception, right? So let's say that you have a charter school that is teaching advanced physics. And in some areas, it's very difficult to find a certified physics teacher. But there may be a local university, for example, where there's a retired professor or you know, an uh, adjunct professor who might want to teach in that, in that school. And I think it's really important to remember that you know, really what we want to see are outcomes, not just inputs. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's a thing, that, that's having certification is something on the front end that we would hope would suggest that that's going to be a quality teacher. But there's actually a lot of research that says that you know, it, it's a mixed bag. Sometimes you get a great certified teacher and sometimes you don't. And you know, I think that, again, really I think Chris mentioned uh, outcomes. And I think it's important that we focus on making sure that all of our teachers, regardless of their credentials, are really serving kids well. Well, I think, and she's, it's a great question that she asked. If we're being held to a higher standard, then why aren't our teachers being held to a higher standard? Right. That's a fair question. And so when you look at the charter school system, a lot of those teachers do come from Teach for America, would mm -hmm. you say? I mean, that would be an accurate way of saying that. They're not required to be certified uh, teachers. Well, to clarify, to okay. Teach for America teachers are certified. All of them are certified? So they, they, yeah, they work towards their certification and then they are by law. So they're working, working towards their certification while they're teaching. They're not necessarily certified when they begin teaching. But that's true of right? a lot of alternative okay. programs. But, but are they required, they're not required to be certified? Through this new law, they would not be they required. They would not be required. Um, but I would like to say that they are being held accountable, right? So if that teacher is not performing well, that school leader has an obligation, and that's true of traditional or charter, mm -hmm. to either provide resources to that teacher to help them get better or to remove that teacher from the classroom. And at the end of the day, charter schools are held accountable for their results, and if they can't perform, then you know they, they can be shut down, and we have shut down poor performing charter schools. And so you know, in terms of teachers, it behooves you <laughs> <laughs> to make sure yeah. that you have an excellent teacher in every classroom, regardless of how they got into the classroom. Yeah, well, and I think you bring up another excellent point. If these charters are not working, then what happens? And Chris, that's something that you mentioned as well. How long do you have to determine whether a charter school is working? Yeah, well, I, I think it, it, what our state's actually been a leader on uh, in, in the entire country is, is particularly with what our Bessie Board has done in holding charter schools accountable. Uh, so they're given an initial contract of five years, but at the three-year mark, there's a check-in based on performance. This is something Veronica mentioned, performance, their financials, and their governance. Uh, and Louisiana, as your you know, previous video showed, uh, has actually been very consistent that if you don't meet the bar, even if you're a tenth of a point away, that school is not renewed because it's a very minimal bar. Mm -hmm. And so the vast majority of our charter schools have surpassed that and really been judged more so by their growth. Um, particularly out of New Orleans. I was a, a teacher in New Orleans before the hurricane 
hurricane and it, the last thing we were doing in that system was educating kids it was dysfunctional mm -hmm. and the reality is is that the charter school movement really allowed i think again this empowerment of educators both educators that have been a part of the traditional system and otherwise to now finally have control over their budget over their time uh, over the resources and that's something that i think we really need to talk more about especially in this consensus building is what are we doing in all schools to make sure the resources and the decision making power is actually at the school level to empower those schools to do what's best for kids and I think that's that's the reality uh, we see here. And then knowing that our school districts could model themselves, and many do, mm -hmm. but after Bessie, you know, look at the high standards they've held for charter schools. If every district around the state did that for all schools, not just the charters, but why aren't all our schools held to sort of a three-year look at performance or a five-year <coughs> contract? I think that'd be really interesting to that's try. That's a good question. <coughs> and we also have Nathaniel, another student, who has a question for our panelists as well. Uh, my question is, I actually attend a rural charter school in Mansur, Louisiana, and the general consensus is that um, charter schools in more urban areas perform better than charters in suburban and rural areas. Can you tell me why that is? <laughs> I, mean, I'll, I'll, I, I mean, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I think he, so you're referring to, I think, the, the Credo study out of Stanford University, right. which, you know, nationally found that charter schools didn't perform any better, any worse than most schools. But Louisiana was interesting in that the charter schools here actually outperformed, on average, traditional schools. And when you dug in a little more closely, it actually said that the schools in New Orleans specifically were outperforming. And I, and I think it's because there is this intense focus. Uh, on really what, what does autonomy really mean and you get this environment where because every school is operating in a way that all the principals have decision making power there's a lot more collaboration a lot more competition and pressure just school to school not traditional versus charter but more of, of we know we have to get results we know we have to keep our best talent we know the talent that's not working out for our kids needs to be moved out quickly and I think maybe that 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 ecosystem isn't felt as much in other parts of the state but but I do know there are lots of people doing pioneering things in other parts and and even those schools while maybe not as strong uh, certainly because of the rules of the state board and otherwise are going to be held accountable for their results and if they're not getting it done ultimately I, I need uh, they'll be, they'll be closed sure, down. Go ahead, I, I disagree with the credo study which classified the suburban schools as, as lesser or not as not as effective. Uh, I think the way the, the way the study was structured was wrong. For example, they compared the New Orleans charter schools to the New Orleans uh, uh, direct run schools, and those are the very poorest schools in the state. So when you compare the charter schools to the poorest run schools in the state, obviously you had an an improvement or a, a, a better performance. The suburban schools are being compared to the local school systems where, where they're located. So that's one of the reasons. But if you look at the scores of the students, you guys are doing better than the schools are in, in the New Orleans area. I can assure you, uh, on the average, much better. Veronica, you want to jump in? Sure. So I just wanted to make a quick clarification, and I'm going to get super nerdy really quickly, which is Great. me all the time. But <laughs> um, So actually, in the Credo study, they used a virtual twin model, which means that you're not comparing the school in Mansour, the, tr the traditional schools in Mansour, to the, or to the charter schools in Mansour. What you do is for each individual student, you look at their demographics, right? So, you know, we take Nat. Right? right, and we're going to try and find another kid in the state of Louisiana who matches Nat's demographics for the most part. And so when we when we use the Credo study and we say that charters are outperforming traditional schools, or whenever we're talking about data in that study, you have to remember that you're talking about the entire state and finding kids in the aggregate who look like the kids who um, are in the charters as well. So it could be that the suburban and rural schools, you know, some of the kids who matched you demographically elsewhere were doing well, but perhaps sitting in the district that you're in, you're actually outperforming that district. So I just wanted to make that clarification. And, yes. and if I may interject, I'm always concerned about the studies that we we hear about for various things, and uh, it just gives the public a false sense of understanding uh, what is happening in in our charter schools and once again my my real issue is with the fact that we are siphoning off the resort the the funding the funding is not put in place to assist all children within the public setting uh, again when I look at charter schools and we we tout them as public systems public schools 
I see them as private schools using uh, public funds. And again, I think we have a responsibility to uh, educate the children, provide those outcomes, and we could do it if we worked together and we weren't in competition. While we're saying that we don't want the competition, the competition is there. It's very evident. And uh, I don't know if we'll ever get on the same page. Uh, let's, let's, because I'm, I'm hearing a lot about best practices and standards here. And we actually have a question from Clarence uh, about standards um, uh, as it relates to the Board of, uh, the Department of Education. Yes, Your so question? Anya, my question was, was, how does the Department of Education sharing the data on best practices and innovation in our charter schools with the, with the rest of um, the Louisiana's public schools? I'm, I am a superintendent of a traditional system, as I pointed out, and uh, we are making it happen within our district. And that's why I, my belief is that when you hire leaders within a district, that those leaders should take the initiative and make great things happen. They need to do their research. They need to implement the best practices. And I, as a Bessie member, often tell Superintendent White at Bessie meetings that I don't believe that he is doing enough as our state superintendent of education to support our traditional systems. The focus is on charters, and I feel that, that he is neglecting in that sense, and I feel that many individuals would agree with me. Let me ask you about the whole money issue that's involved and, you know, companies coming in here and uh, setting up schools, charter schools. Is that a real concern that it's a money-making venture for a lot of these companies? And, and how does that factor into the real education of our students? It, Mike, it's you're shaking your head. Concern. It's a big concern. It's a big concern. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, many of the charter schools are run, even if they're nonprofits, they're actually run by profit-making organizations. I think the Edison company that uh, handled the uh, capital school was a, was a profit organization. So don't assume that because it says nonprofit that it really is nonprofit. So they can milk the system for as much money as they can make with it by hiring the least expensive teachers. Uh, and uh, for another thing they do, which I, I think we should all be against, is they're exempted from being part of the teacher retirement system. The legislature assesses a special assessment to all of our local school systems uh, to pay for the unfunded liability of the teacher's retirement system. When a school is allowed to escape the retirement system, they're saving 20, 27%, well, about at least 20% of the cost of the salaries by shortchanging the Louisiana system. That's, that's a big mistake, and it just puts a bigger and bigger burden on the rest of the school systems. So in terms of retirement, there are 120 charter schools currently in the state. Um, over half of them actually do belong to the TRSL system. Um, and the ones that don't provide a, a different retirement plan for their teachers. Um, the but I think the point he's making is that it's optional. Right, they don't right. Have so it's to do optional. It. And so I would just like to point out that the UAL that, that Mike is talking about is huge. And it's a big problem for traditional schools and for schools that are in TRSL. But that, the reason why it sits at $18.3 billion and right And when you now, say UAL? It's the unfunded accrued liability. Uh -huh. um, it's because it was, it was mismanaged. Um, and there's a legislative auditor's report that talks about how over the years it was mismanaged and blew up to such a large number. If you put in all of the, uh, the schools that aren't in TRSL into it, you generate about 6 to $10 million. That's one five hundredth of the UAL. So really, I agree with Mike in the sense that it is a big problem, but it's not because of charters, right? It, <laughs> it is an issue that we as a state, we as a people in Louisiana, need to encourage our legislators to help us figure out how to fix. Okay, Chris, you wanna? Well, I mean, I, I think that, that point exactly is, is this is one of those innovations I think we could actually learn from, from private schools, from charter schools and, and others. And I think our districts in many ways have been asking for relief from this. I mean, why is it uh, forced upon everyone to be in a system that promises 100% of salary for, you know, more years than you actually spend in the classroom? I think we've sort of gotten upside down in, in that work. And I think it's, it's putting a burden more and more on all of our kids and all of our families. And I think it's something we need to, to solve. I, I think on the point of, of schools competing for students, I mean, so often, and 
the debate devolves right back into a question of money instead of again mm. going back to that core of mm. we should have our schools competing for all of our kids I mean you know certainly that happens at the college and university level why is it not happening in our neighborhoods like the achievement zone that was mentioned where 26 out of 31 schools have a DRF letter grade I mean why why aren't we going in there and saying we want your child to have the best opportunity here's what this program offers and and then you know someone else saying here's what this one offers and allowing those those opportunities to compete so long as we make sure that government officials really focus on again outcomes that government should manage to the outcomes and the accountability not what happens on the front end not what's happening day to day in schools that's best left to the educators and adults. you know we're always talking about um, schools um, and whether you know the school system attracts business and new people to uh, to the state and patty um, has a question along those lines yes right and that was my question is do you think that the having the option of having charter schools here and different types of schools through the charters um, is attractive to businesses coming into Louisiana? I, I mean, so my organization, New Schools for Baton Rouge, is, is specifically focused on uh, recruiting organizations locally and nationally that have exceptional track records and asking them to do more, do another school. Um, and, and I'm talking about schools that are knocking out of the park regardless of the background of those families. I think any business asks about that. In fact, in our partnerships with uh, local businesses and industries, we hear it all the time of uh, folks saying, you know, we, we don't see a great option in the public system, so we have to pay our workers more so they'll stay with us so they can actually afford the private school tuition. And I think, you know, especially because of the, the comments about taxpayers, they are investing a lot of dollars uh, in, in schools here in Louisiana. You know, mm -hmm. over $8 billion annually is spent on public education and f consistently for the last 20 years, our results have basically been flat. And, and so I think at some point we've got to start asking ourselves, what are we doing differently? And, and again, it's going to take all of us. It's, it can't just be a charter solution. It can't just be a traditional solution. It can't be a private solution. But it, it's something that if we don't fix, I do think we won't see the wins we've seen recently with IBM and others. I think we'll see the out-migration start even faster. Well, Dr. Vibi, I want to get your take on that. You said it just can't be a, a public school or charter school or private school solution. Do you feel that the solution has many different tiers to it, or how do, how do you Once take again, that? I think the charter schools have a role, but uh, I would like to speak to an experience just recently in a neighboring district. Uh, there was uh, a request for a type one charter and uh, the community got, the business community got involved uh, but and then it was based not because the, the school district was failing but because uh, of attempts to uh, pass a bond, the taxpayers didn't support it so then there is a lack of facility, there is a lack of facility space and so the uh, the group that came in, the charter groups, uh, they instead of building uh, the the facilities in an area that is most at risk, they were putting the facility in a uh, most prominent area, which it would not cater to the the students most in need, but to the more affluent population, and that's a big concern I have. I mean, let's put the facts on the table. You know, it's uh, we have a responsibility, as I see the charter schools. Have, could play a role in addressing the most at, at risk population, but that, you know, in the, the experiences I've had with charter operators, the uh, intent, as I see it, the objective is to uh, secure those students who are most likely to succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Maxwell, yes. Um, my question would be um, you talked about the three year, uh, the grading system. And if I were operating a charter school and in three years I was expected to be meeting certain standards, uh, my, I might, if I had a failing school, I might be more prone, because if it's a failing grade, you have some kids above and some kids below, I might be more prone to take the kids above to have a better chance of passing uh, that requirement. And I was just wondering, uh, what is in place to prevent, you know, because one of the great things about public education is it's a promise to all kids to have that education. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, what's to prevent a charter school from just taking the top? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I think if, if you thought about government working more as a, a regulator of outcomes 
It would also say there's probably some certain fair rules of the game, just like we might see in a football match, right? So in a football game, there's certain rules that everyone knows to play by, and then you, you work as hard as you can to sort of have the most competitive team uh, to win on the field. I think just as in a school, so in New Orleans, recognizing that most of the schools were charters and had independent lotteries, you know, there could be examples, there could be times that folks would maneuver the system. So government in this case said, you know what, it actually makes sense to work with Orleans Parish School System, Recovery School District, private schools, and the, the, the charter schools that were authorized by the state to have one common enrollment system where parents could exercise choice at any school. So to a parent, it didn't matter if your choice was, you know, your first choice was a, a private school, your second choice was an Orleans Parish school, your third choice was a charter. You just saw schools and you made your choice based on what you thought quality was. And interestingly, if you've looked at the results of those, parents have overwhelmingly favored the schools that have had higher growth and higher performance levels. So parents already are following with their feet, <clears throat> trying to get into the schools that have the best results. And in this case, government then can act as a kind of intermediary to say, let's make sure no one is gaming the system. Let's make sure every kid has fair access. I completely agree with you. And I think that's a proper role that government could play without trying to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the I school. I don't think government is doing its job on that. I think it is an excellent question to ask, uh, What, why will they game the system? Will they try to remove the the students that are not performing. We know that there are selective uh, dismissals out of those schools. We know that there are children that are being counseled out of those schools because they're not performing. We know that the discipline policy in many of the charter schools is a way of removing kids that are not performing. Usually the ones that are not performing well are discipline problems. It mm -hmm. all goes together. Mm -hmm. And so then the public schools become a dumping ground. And uh, all of a sudden you have a self-fulfilling prophecy where the charter school looks great because they've been able to call out some of the students. Now, I got to bring, it's Jamar? Jamar. Jamar, I, I got to bring you in on this because you uh, were very adamant earlier when you said that the charter schools are not selective. And we've heard over and over again that in fact they are. And Mike, you just said that we do know this, that they are. So what are you, what is your response to what you're hearing? I can only speak of the charter schools that I'm actually aware <laughs> of in New Orleans that are following the process to make sure that all the kids in New Orleans have received a quality education. You know, just hearing the concept, one of the biggest misconception is we're acting like the educational system in Louisiana is working. When we look at the score, when we look at the performance score of our kids, when we see how they're performing in English and math, when we look at our national ranking, all of our kids are at risk. All of our kids are at risk of not succeeding. So something had to happen. We're giving the kids of New Orleans an opportunity to succeed, all of our kids. So every parent are actively walking with their feet to decide on what school they would like to send their child to. And they're actively involved in the process to make sure that their child is receiving a quality education. I believe that all of the kids in Louisiana are at risk, and I believe that charter schools are providing all of the kids their opportunity to have success. So in New Orleans, we're not selective. In New Orleans, the kids and the families are actively getting involved in the educational yeah. system to be proactive, to make sure their kid actually have a chance to succeed. Yeah, okay, go ahead. And just to uh, respond to your comments, uh, in fact, I have uh, visited New Orleans and I have uh, discussed with parents uh, those schools that have the mission focus. And in my opinion, that is selective admissions. In fact, one of the uh, supporters of, that, of a um, charter school there with the mission focus indicated that as part of the um, interview process, they seek out leaders. And I have the same program in one of my schools in St. Martin Parish, and the gentleman told me he was looking for leaders. Well, my teacher does not have, is not afforded the opportunity <clears throat> to dismiss students who are not the leaders he has identified. So again, you know, we can say there is no selective admission, but we know better. You talk about parents, you know, pounding the pavement, looking for the best option for their, uh, for their kids. It just seems like it's so confusing. I mean, how do parents really navigate the school, the options that they do have? I mean, it just seems like it could be overwhelming for parents, and they really do need to be proactive. What do you say to parents to help them figure this all out? Sure, I would love to take that question. Um, and also just to clarify, there are 120 charter schools in the state of Louisiana. 60 of them are type five charter schools, which means that they're open enrollment, they can't have selective criteria. So I just do wanna make sure that people understand that in New Orleans, the overwhelming majority of charter schools are absolutely 
open enrollment and they aren't choosing who comes in and who leaves. Um, in terms of the system though, I do agree that it can be confusing. There are, uh, you know, there are five different types of charter schools. In the future there could potentially be seven because there are two additional mm -hmm. ones on the, uh, on the books right now. Um, and there are, there are resources for those parents. Um, the Charter School Association provides something that we call LA School Finder, which is sort of like um, Carfax. If you've ever you know, looked for a car online, mm -hmm. you use Carfax. Mm -hmm. LA School Finder is like that. You, you put in information for what you're looking for, and it shows you the various different schools. Also, um, in New Orleans specifically, there's a parent guide that comes out right. um, that helps parents. Um, but I do think that, you know, in general, I think that's a fair that's a fair statement that it can be a little overwhelming. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, Mike. Did you want to get in there? Well, I was just going to say it's it's very difficult to have the parents try to decide what school their child should attend, unless, of course, it's a, it's a very specific thing like. If there's a school offering a technical program and, they, and their child wants to be a welder or wants to be a, a technician of some type, maybe a, a computer programmer, uh, certainly that would be the, the school that, that you could choose. So, uh, but most schools, what we need to have in Louisiana is to have every school that has excellent teachers and to make sure that we have a broad program offered to all the children so that no matter what child comes to that school, he or she will get a good education. So we need to put our parents' minds to rest by making sure that all schools are good. Yeah, um, yeah I'm sorry. And I, I visited a school today and it's identified, uh, labeled a C. Uh, my grandson attends that school and I saw some very exemplary teaching today. And by Bessie's definition, a C is failure. In fact, our governor was on national news uh, indicating, uh, pointing out that the St. Martin Parish School System had six uh, students uh, who were afforded the voucher because they were attending an F school. Well, it, the school is not an F school, but by def Bessie's definition, it is a failing, failing school. school. When I grew up, when I went through traditional the traditional program, a C was average. Today, I sit with a doctorate and again, I made a few C's in my life, so that doesn't mean I'm a failure. I think a work ethic is very important. Our students need those work ethics. They, that needs to be instilled within them. We need the quality teachers. We need to provide the professional learning. Often we hear of these um, various countries and how uh, excellent right. educational programs they have, but they provide the professional learning for their teachers, job embedded during the day, and you know, so again, when we hold up these other countries, we need to be, uh, we need to inform the public that we are doing things differently. And perhaps if we follow their lead, we could do a better job at what we Let's do. Let's bring in some more of our audience members. Erin, your question for our panelists. Oh, my question was, um, what is the demand for enrollment? How many students enroll and are not able to get into a charter school, and ultimately, what do they do? Mike or Chris, you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, so in, in New Orleans, I mean, you had wait lists, you know, when there was individual school lotteries, wait lists in the hundreds um, of families wanting to go there. You know, in the most recent applications where everyone can put up to eight choices of where they want to go, regardless of the school, you do see a trend that the higher performing schools, the schools that are growing more academically, are the ones getting more and more parents saying, we want to go to that school. So, you know, I, I think, I think we, we maybe sell parents a little short. Uh, by not saying they can navigate this, and we figure out how to navigate a lot of choices in our life. And I think in, in many ways, and what you see in New Orleans, it looks like, you know, if, if you go right before the school starts, and our, uh, this fellow school leader down here could, could attest to this, the medians, it looks like election day. I mean, medians are filled with signs about, you know, our school focuses on this unique thing, or our school does this. Here's our test scores. I mean, you would never believe people that are talking about, you know, I, my kid goes to the fastest growing school in all of Louisiana. I mean, these are things that parents rally around, and they've really figured out how to navigate, and we see that their, their, their choices are following so the results. What's going on in New Orleans? Is that all being replicated in the other parishes where there are charter schools? I mean, are parents in those I can, uh, I parishes? I can for Baton Rouge. In Baton Rouge, it's just the opposite. Uh, instead of students flocking to the nine charter schools in Baton Rouge, they've been leaving those charter schools, and the enrollment has dropped to less than half of what it started off being. So I guess if you had a system that's almost 100% charter schools, certainly you're going to have competition to where it's, you know, which charter school do I want to attend? In the Baton Rouge area, it's just the opposite. 
the children have been able to say, or the parents have, have said, I think I would rather stay with the traditional schools in many cases. Kathy, I want to get you in on this conversation. Your question for well, our guests. Actually, ha ha Haley? Haley. Haley <laughs> actually touched on my question, and Veronica actually uh, uh, answered the question, but I w would like to hear from the other panel uh, list on do teachers in the charter, charter schools, do they have to be certified? And if not, why is it flip-flop from charters and it's not in the public schools they have to do? You'd have to ask a legislator that because that's part of the legislation passed, I think, in 2012. And I question that daily because as a superintendent, uh, and a former personnel director, I had to seek certified teachers. And I certainly advocate certified teachers in the classroom because they meet that standard. And I often tell people, if I'm going to a surgeon, I want to make sure that that surgeon is credentialed. And I believe our teachers need to have that, that teacher certification. And I've heard the critics who say, well, you know, and I agree that oftentimes you'll find that teacher or, or several teachers that it's just an innate quality that they could teach. I mean, they're, they're natural born mm -hmm. teachers, <laughs> but I believe those standards should be met. And again, it was uh, through legislation. However, in policy, it says that public school teachers should possess a certification. But again, the legislature uh, in 2012 indicated that this is not a requirement. We, we are running very, very short on time, and uh, Chris, you look like you wanted to. Uh, well, I was just saying quickly. In. There's a lot of surgeons around the world, but when you need the best health care, you come to the United States because you're looking for very specific skill sets and people. I think charters are no different. Remember, the vast majority are certified, but it's not necessarily linked to performance. And so, charter schools have a pressure because of the accountability standards that if they don't produce results and they don't build the best team to help them produce results then they're going to be put out of business. And so that's the appropriate place to focus, not necessarily on the inputs. Let's, let's keep talking about the outcomes of our kids. Let's that keep talking. That was an absolute back, step backwards. That was an absolute step backwards <laughs> to take, to remove the, uh, the requirement for certification. And we're going to have to let that be the last word. <laughs> thank you all so very much. We have run out of time for our Q&A segment, but we'd like to thank all of our panelists. You all have been just fantastic. Verona, Veronica Brooks. Michael Deshotel, Chris Meyer, and Dr. Lottie Beebe. Thank you all so very much for being here. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. Well, Shauna, charter schools are certainly a big topic in mm -hmm. New Orleans, Baton Rouge. I see this conversation spreading across the state for all of our viewers around Louisiana. Uh, I think it's been very thoughtful and uh, a lot of questions that uh, still need further flushing out. Right, and very collaborative. We wanted this to be a very collaborative discussion. I think that's what we had here tonight. But I think one of the big things that uh, came out for me is that uh, it seems to be a consensus among our audience members and our panelists. It's not uh, traditional versus charter. Uh, charters are here, they're here to stay, and uh, there seems to be a place for all of them. So. Well, and, and we didn't even get into all the virtual right, and no, all of the online right, things we right. can talk about. So well, it's a constant conversation. Absolutely. <laughs> That's all the time, though, we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. While you're there, take this month's survey. View extended interview clips and comment on tonight's show. We'd love to hear from you, as we did from viewers following last month's program, Gay in Louisiana. Scott, who is gay, writes, I was denied employment in the housing department uh, of a major Texas university based on the religious beliefs of my supervisor. His religion told him being gay was unacceptable. My religious beliefs would not be considered. Well, Yousef writes to us, the word gay means happy. It should not be used to describe homosexuals in any way, form, or fashion. And John writes, thank you, LPB, for producing Public Square, a program that Louisianians are fortunate to have that fosters enlightening discussions about tonight's topic and others. Well, thank you to everyone for their comments. And under mandatory drug sentences, uh, cost Louisiana taxpayers millions of dollars to incarcerate people charged with simple possession of marijuana. Would a reduction in penalties encourage more usage or help free up prison space for violent offenders? Join us next month as Louisiana Public Square explores these issues and more on pot or not the legalization debate. Thanks so oh, well. much for watching and everybody have a good night. That should be interesting indeed. Very interesting. Well, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, everyone.
For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. 